So welcome in everyone. Just making sure everyone um, from the waiting room gets admitted and then we'll go ahead and get started. So again, if you are just joining us, um, please uh, put your name, um, the agency you're, you're with, and then the county um, that you are either in or that um, your organization serves. And we'll get started in just a second. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, love to see all the different county representation that's in thrown in the chat. Um, my name is Michelle. I am the Outreach Coordinator for Prevent Child Abuse Nevada. Um, and so again, just to honor everybody's time, we'll go ahead and get started um, for today's webinar. Um, if you do see me pause and look at my screen, I am letting people in <laughs> into the uh, from the waiting room. So bear with with me. Um, so to get started, uh, we just want to go over some announcements for PCA that we have, um, and then we'll go ahead um, and uh, share it off into our speaker for today. Um, so before uh, continuing, uh, we do like to do a land um, recognition and acknowledgement. Um, so before we get before we begin, we do like to, to take a moment and recognize um, that here in Nevada, we stand on the land of the Washishu, Numu, Nuwe, and Nuwu um, indigenous uh, communities. Um, so we take a moment to recognize and honor their stewardship um, that continues uh, to today. Uh, with this recognition, uh, we state that we state an intention to rightfully include their voice and respect them as the 27 sovereign tribal nations of Nevada. Um, and so we did put a link on there to get a little bit more comprehensive map of um, not just Nevada, but the states. Um, so please feel free to, um, to take a moment and look at that. Okay, uh, moving into some announcements, um, and these are for PCA. Uh, one thing that we wanted to uh, remind folks is um, the Child Abuse Prevention Month summaries. So we know, you know, last month was Child Abuse Prevention Month, and there were so many activities, um, so many awareness activities that were put on from pinwheel plantings to our Gluco Blue Day, um, and a lot of social media awareness. So we were so excited to be a part Part of your guys' activities um, and being able to see um, those awareness um, events being put on. Um, and so we do want to make sure that we do capture um, those uh, activities. Um, and so for the um, end of April, um, we do pull a report together to show um, all the events from the whole state of Nevada. Um, we break it down into counties. And so if you held an event, um, if you had any type of activity uh, for April, um, please send us a summary. Um, we know we've started to receive some of those from our Pinwheel partners, so uh, we appreciate that. Um, we do have till the end of May uh, to receive those. So again, any activity um, for the month of April or that was put on for the month of April, uh, please send us uh, those summaries. Um, I'm gonna throw in the chat um, where those can be sent to. Um, and so, and if you have any questions about what some of the summary details we would like to, you know, have include, uh, please let me, uh, please feel free to reach out and let us know. And then the second um, announcement that we have is PCA Nevada is doing focus groups. Um, so we are working on a public awareness campaign that is 
um, designed to encourage parents and care caregivers to reach out for help and support. Um, so for those there being, uh, if you would like to either host a focus group or if you would like to participate in a focus group, uh, please feel free to reach out. I will put in the chat as well um, some of the, the contact information. Um, you can definitely reach out to, to me um, and I use the Prevent Child Abuse Nevada at unlv.email, um, but you can also reach out to um, Myra Pacheco, um, who is the lead on the focus groups. Um, there is one currently um, schedule that is open to the public that is in Reno and these are statewide by the way so um, we can you know do them virtually um, and some do and we can travel and do some in person as well depending on the needs um, that are um, the organization uh, might have um, so these are just two of the ones that um, sorry one of the ones that we currently have scheduled in Reno for Thursday May 30th um, at 2 from 3 p.m. at the uh, well Black Wall Street, uh, Reno. Um, and so I'll share these flyers as well on the chat. Um, but if you again would like to either participate or um, host a focus group, please feel free to reach out. And I'll throw again all that information in the chat. Alrighty. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, and again, to do our, um, our webinar for today. Um, so Heather Dodo uh, is an educational, educational outreach manager with 10 plus years of experience, working co closely with law enforcement parents co and community members to recover missing children and provide educational uh, resources to prevent children from going missing uh, through real case experience and annual training by the Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force, as well as Crimes Against Children Conference, she stays up, she stays up to date on current trends that put, on, uh, that put our children at risk as they explore the virtual world. So without further ado, I will hand it off to Heather. Thank you for uh, being here with us today. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for um, having me today. Um, you know, uh, su super happy to be here. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, presentations to, you know, share with you guys. Um, and that was an awesome uh, introduction, so I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, uh, what, like she said, my name is Heather Dodo. I am the Education Outreach Coordinator for Nevada Child Seekers. Um, as you can see, uh, we are going to be talking about internet safety and how that uh, correlates with missing children. Um, the thing, the crazy thing about Nevada is that we are the number one state for human trafficking in the country. Uh, we also, you know, specifically here in Southern Nevada, we have a huge entertainment based um, city that, you know, attracts a lot of tourism. And unfortunately, um, you know, there's, you know, all these kind of confusions about legalities with prostitution and stuff like that, that leads so often to um, a lot of our children to be victimized by um, predators. So um, today we are going to, here, let me see if I can get this. Okay. Today we're going to discuss a couple of things. I'm just going to kind of break it down right here. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, runaway and missing children, uh, the connection between runaways, missing children, and how the internet affects that. Um, we're also going to be talking about revealing too much information. I think um, most of us have taken an Internet Safety 101 course, and we know, you know, not to share name, address, things like that. Um, but, you know, nowadays, as people, not just children, but even adults are sharing their lives more and more every day, um, it's leaving our children vulnerable um, because just we're so interconnected in the virtual world. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and how um, we have a lot of this these situations leading to missing children. Uh, we're also going to discuss online predators and human trafficking. Um, like I said, Nevada is number one in the country uh, for human trafficking. So it's definitely something that we need to um, be up to date on as well as uh, its connection to um, the internet. Because, you know, we have these predators who are able to just go through social media and pick out uh, their targets. Um, we're going to also talk about exposure to inappropriate content and how not all online predators um uh, not all their goal is just to physically interact or meet with a child we uh, also have uh, predators whose goal is simply to corrupt the minds of children uh, and then we're going to finish off with resources things that you know uh, you guys can do amongst your organizations and your communities and ways that nevada child seekers can help with a lot of our free workshops and programs um, if you have any questions, you know, I'm more than happy to answer them at the end, uh, and I'll have my contact information at the end as well 
well for anybody who would like to reach out, schedule a workshop, either virtual or in person, we can organize that um, to be arranged, even if you're up in Reno or uh, somewhere else um, in the state of Nevada. As we're down here in Southern Nevada, we can travel. <laughs> uh, so first and foremost, we're just going to kind of talk about Amber Alerts and Runaways. Um, some, you know, when I'm out in the community, we do a lot of these workshops and, and you know, a lot of people um, are asking about, you know, why, you know, if we have so many missing children, which, you know, in the state of Nevada, we have about 8,000 children go missing each year. Um, why are, are we not getting all these Amber Alerts? Why isn't my phone going off? Why am I not constantly seeing these missing children? Uh, and to answer that question, it's because every state has um, a criteria for issuing Amber Alerts. Uh, so if a missing child uh, situation or um, a missing child event is, is, you know, submitted to the police, not all of them will, you know, follow the Amber Alert criteria. Therefore, not every missing child case will have an Amber Alert. Um, so just for those of you who are unaware, um, the Amber Alert criteria is as follows. There has to be a reasonable belief by law enforcement that an abduction has occurred. Um, we also need to believe that uh, the child is in imminent danger uh, or of serious bodily injury or death, okay? Uh, and there's not enough, uh, there has to be enough descriptive information about the victim and the abduction for law enforcement to issue an, issue an Amber Alert. Uh, and the abduction is of a child aged 17 years or younger. And then last but not least, uh, the child's name and other critical data elements, including the child abduction flag, have to have been entered uh, into the National Crime Information Center system. So uh, this is why we might have maybe one, two, three, you know, Amber Alerts every year, or you might not see, you know, that many, even though we have, you know, an enormous amount of children, you know, going missing and running away. And um, of course, according to this criteria, runaway juveniles do not meet the criteria for Amber Alert activations. Now, this is important because, you know, the thing is, these predators are, are kind of, you know, catching up to the idea. Uh, so a lot of our cases at Nevada Child Seekers are actually technically classified as runaways. Uh, and we there's a lot of stigma uh, regarding to runaways. Many people believe, you know, maybe they could go back home at any time. Maybe they're just being a rebellious team. Uh, but like I said, these pre predators are catching on. Uh, and, you know, these predators are now convincing children to willingly leave their home. Um, by talking to them on the internet and convincing them to walk out the door. Uh, therefore, even though this child might technically qualify as a runaway because they willingly left the home, uh, in reality, this child was lured out of the home and maybe, you know, abducted once they had left. Uh, so this kind of leads, leaves a huge gap uh, in, in our vulnerable children um, because, you know, now these predators are just getting the children to come to them. We're not having the, you know, predators coming up to the house and kidnapping them and throwing them into the white van. So um, we just have to be mindful that, you know, every time we make a step in the right direction, these predators are watching and, and finding alternative ways to gain access to our children. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, you know, it's important that, you know, we have you know, security and understanding of how these predators are gaining access to our children and how their internet presence has a lot to do with it. Um, these predators are using, like I said, social media like a catalog to choose their targets. They're just going through social media, seeing um, what child fits the description of what kind of, you know, target they're looking for. Uh, and it's easier than ever to get into contact with minors. Um, so that's why it's so, so important that not only are we observing um, our children's internet presence, but our own. Uh, what can people see about me? What is apparent to others if they were to Google search my name? What would they find about me? Um, this is a really great way to, you know, keep, you know, be aware of unauthorized use of name, pictures, personal information. Um, I always recommend to parents and all everybody who has a presence on the internet, uh, just one day play private investigator on yourself and see uh, what you can find. Um, we've had cases where unfortunately parents and adults were oversharing on their social media and it left their children vulnerable. Uh, so before we ever move into, you know, how to keep our children safe, we all, it's also very important to be aware of how we may uh, leave our youth and our children exposed by what we share with the best intentions. 
Um, so, you know, just check out your name, Google search your full name. Uh, there are websites, especially if you're a registered voter, uh, that will host uh, information uh, without you even knowing it. And you wouldn't know it was there unless you Google searched yourself and found it. And um, that information won't be removed unless you ask for it to be removed. Uh, we've had in some of my workshops, parents able to uh, find their current address and the last three residents that they had previously lived in just by Google searching their name. Uh, so something as simple as Google search can, you know, tell you a lot about what your internet presence is. Um, and on top of that, it's like I said, uh, we'll have these parents and these adults who are exposing their children based on what they're posting. Um, so, you know, these are just some basic recommendations. I know some of them seem pretty obvious, but, you know, with some of our cases, it's been clear that these things need to be reiterated and, and discussed because uh, sometimes you're just, you know, with the innocent, with the most innocent intentions, you're posting things, um, not realizing again that it's leaving your children exposed. So, for example, the front of your house, um, there have been situations where, you know, we had a teenage girl who was uh, taking pictures in front of her garage for prom or a dance and you know somebody was able to figure out where her residence was because of things in the background of photos uh, it's super important to be aware of what you can find on photos because there's so much that can be pieced together just by those few things. Um, avoid posting children unless they're teenagers and can fully consent. So there's a lot of issues with that. Um, children in any form or partial or full nudity, including bathing suits and bathtub photographs are something to be very wary of. Uh, when you're going on a long trip, post when you return home where you attend school work, if you live alone, or the number of people in your house, or those really cute stickers you see on the back of cars where it shows your family and pets. Um, we just really don't wanna be sharing uh, information that can let anybody know uh, our schedule, things about our life, our residents. Uh, something that's becoming trendier now, especially on TikTok and YouTube, uh, full house or apartment tours. Um, and then packages or mail with barcodes. That's one that's usually pretty surprising to people. Um, if you look at the photos on uh, the side right here, you'll see um, this really cute picture of a little girl who's sharing her first day of school, her first day of kindergarten. And, you know, this is a really cute idea with, again, the most innocent intentions. Uh, but for a predator, Heather, this is a lot of information. Heather, I'm oh, so yes. sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know, we are not seeing your slides. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Sorry, everyone. Here, let's figure this out. Why? Okay. Share screen. Let's see. Okay. Are you guys seeing it now? Yes. All right. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. So as you can see from the photos, <laughs> I'll start from right there. Uh, here's that photo of a little girl on her first day of school, her first day of kindergarten. And for a predator, this kind of gives a lot of information. Um, as you can see, I can see her school, uh, how old she is. I know her favorite color. I know her teacher's name. I know when she's gonna graduate. Uh, and I know just a few little things about her uh, to know some of her interests, which is, you know, vital information if a predator wanted to, you know, begin learning about a potential target. And like I said, sometimes as parents and um, as guardians, we expose our children based on, you know, again, the most innocent of intentions is a picture like this. Um, as you can see on the bottom as well, uh, behind that little girl who just went swimming, there's a barcode. Uh, and you'll see in a video on the next slide how how um, this can be used to discover the address um, of where this uh, particular package was being sent to. Um, so things like, again, that you would never even think of, maybe you're not Not sharing your address, maybe you're not sharing like the side of your room um, being something that exposes uh, our families to predators. Okay. Um, like I said, we're we're in a we're in a completely different age of technology. Um, you know, if you are familiar with Snapchat, having just your location on uh, can show us. You know, you're able to see the exact latitude and longitude of location of where 
this particular person is if they have uh, their location services on. Um, and from many of my presentations, I usually do a little vote where it's like, how many of you, um, once you stopped using your maps or uh, your Apple maps or your Google maps, how many of you turn off your location? And most people will forget and leave it on. Uh, and that's how sometimes, you know, we can leave ourselves exposed literally you know, these phones are like a tracking device. Um, so in regards to Snapchat, you know, there's a little character that you can have, I can zoom in, and I can actually see the exact latitude and longitude of where this person is standing in their room. Uh, we've had situations like this happen on Facebook and other apps, any app that gives permission to have your location, there's a way to see exactly where you are. Um, so we're always recommending that you turn off that location. Uh, we've also had situations where um, predators are using reverse image search to identify uh, where a photo was taken uh, in order to figure out where um, a person was. Uh, something as simple as sharing a school mascot can tell me what school your child goes to. Um, so for example, in Clark County School District here in Southern Nevada, uh, there's three schools who have school ma mascot that's a hawk. Uh, one's an elementary school, one's a middle school, and one's a high school. And if I just saw a picture of your child on Facebook, I would be able to probably narrow down what school your child goes to. Um, so things like that is just, you know, very you wouldn't really think of it. Um, but again, this is like leaving um, children exposed and, and their fam whole families exposed. So I'm just going to play this little video about uh, how this woman was able to literally figure out where the address of this family is just by reverse image search um, and package location and Zillow even. So um, hopefully you can hear it. Let's see if uh, this works. All right. So I'm not sure if you guys were able to hear that, um, but she was literally able to use reverse image search, uh, Zillow, and, you know, just what she had posted on her TikTok um, to figure out where this family lived. And again, you know, most of us are posting online, not thinking we're sharing all these things. And then here we are in the in the age that we're at with technology, where we're able to figure out where somebody is with just a few clicks. Um, so not only, you know, before we start to scrutinize our youth and our children, uh, we have to set that example of, you know, really being stingy of what we're sharing online and understanding what is important to be personal and what's important to be private um, and making sure we're not accidentally exposing ourselves. Uh, and that begins, you know, keeping our children safe begins with that. And moving on from that, it's also important to really know what our children are doing online. Um, the thing about, you know, where we're at in society is children are using, they're growing up with these devices, they're growing up with this technology, it's part of their life, it's part of like, it's just what they know. And because of that, we have these children who are using their devices like diaries. They'll post every time they're sad on social media, um, every time they're having a hard time, they're going to share, 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 share. Uh, and in such a way, these kids are having double lives. They have their real physical life every day they go to school, when they come home for dinner, see mom and dad. But then they have this whole other life that's going on, which is their virtual life. They can be whoever they want. They can do whatever they want. And if mom and dad are not paying attention they can talk to whoever they want, just like they could talk to strangers in the real world. Um, you know, I have always talked to parents and I've had parents who have told me, you know, I would never invade my child's privacy by looking through their phone. Uh, I can't imagine not trusting my child, um, you know, to be wise with their social media or I've talked to them. I don't have to worry about checking their devices. Uh, and, you know, often, you know, I guess it's just the work I do. It, it's it's kind of crazy to me because, um, like I said, these kids will share everything online sometimes. And we've had cases where if mom and dad had just looked at their child's social media, 
they would know about a predator. They would know about a child who was about to self-harm. They would know about a child about to do something very risky that they shared about on social media. And if mom and dad just checked that phone, we could have avoided a disaster. Um, so it's so important as, as you know, parents and guardians and, and, and as, you know, community members that we remind parents that we need to be involved in both lives because these kids have two. Um, we can be, you know, we can keep them inside safe in their little bubble all day, but they're exposed uh, through the internet. If the internet has access to your child, or if your child has access to the internet, that internet has access to your kid. Um, there have been cases where kids were literally talking to their their abductor that was about to be their abductor uh, and they're talking online to them in the living room right next to their mom and again if mom just you know checked their phone um, uh, again that disaster can have been avoided so you know it's really more than just a privacy thing it's about you know being a present parent and understanding that you know this technology and and how much it's integrated in our children's lives is a new thing it's a new thing and it's also something that these predators are taking advantage of so we need to be on top of it and we need to make sure our kids are safe um while enjoying it of course it's a tool you know we don't need to hide them away from it but it's something to really keep in mind now when i do these workshops um, you know, I like to have a lot of fun with them. I, I don't just do them for community uh, organizations and parents. I also do them with students as well. Uh, sometimes just kind of, you know, uh, make it interesting. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes, you know, look up a real world uh, social media account and see how much I can find just with a few clicks. Um, and this is uh, just to preemptively, you know, this is all online. Um, this is a real <laughs> child whose uh, information, like I, I, an example of uh, how easy it can be for a stranger to find out information. Um, and this is probably the most compelling case that I've ever kind of done with a class. Um, so I'm just going to kind of jump into it so you guys get what I mean. Uh, I went on Instagram and this is a couple years ago. I went on Instagram and I just decided to look up a middle school in my area. I live in Las Vegas in Southern Nevada. Uh, so we cho chose a school that I just, you know, often went to at the time uh, to see if I could find any of the students that was in my after school program or to see if I can, you know, play predator in a sense. It's kind of like pretending, right? So all I did is looked up a middle school. And when I looked up that middle school, a bunch of these photos popped up, nothing unusual. Uh, but the first one that you can see here uh, was one of my students, her name's Jayla. Uh, she's super outgoing, super friendly, um, very popular in school. This was a couple years ago, now she's you know grown up. Uh, and I decided right then, I'm gonna pick on her, <laughs> all right? Uh, so I go on her profile, and as you can see, this is a pretty standard profile for Instagram of a, of a teenager or a tweenager, okay? Um, right off the bat, I have just a little bit of information, all right? I have her first and last name. I have her age. I have her birthday. I know what grade she's in. I have her Snapchat, so if I wanted to reach out to her or if she had her location on uh, through her Bitmoji on Snapchat, I'd be able to track exactly where she is. But for granted, let's just keep moving on. Uh, I also see what city she's living in. Uh, so, you know, again, this is a pretty standard profile. Um, there's quite a bit of information, but not really anything that would make most people nervous. Um, but keep in mind, this is what I'm starting with. And I'm going to show you how these situations kind of snowball into an opportunity for predators. Um, I started going through her photos. She has lots of photos because, again, this is Instagram. And I found out that uh, Jayla has a best friend named Violet. Um, so Violet is in the comments right here and she's, you know, saying thanks, uh, cause this post is just a shout out for their friendship. And now I have access to Violet's account. So I decided to go on Violet's account to see, you know, if I can find anything out about Jayla through her social media. And I go on there and Violet's really smart. Her account's on private, so I can't look at any of her photos. Uh, but I do have her Snapchat. So if I wanted to, I could reach out to Violet, uh, and maybe see if she can, you know, tell me anything about Jayla, or maybe she has her tracking on, maybe I can kind of narrow down where Jayla is. But uh, for here, I'm just going to say this is a dead end because her account's private and move on. But quick side note on that. So I go back to this uh, original photo. 
And the reason why this photo popped up, if you look right under the follow button, it's because when she posted this photo, she tagged the middle school. Uh, in the comments, she also confirms that this is the middle school that she goes to. Um, so I know that that's her school. She didn't go to a friend's school. This is the school that she goes to. And if you look at the bottom right here by the likes, uh, this post was two days old. So I know she didn't move away. It's a very high chance that she's still going to this middle school. Um, so, okay, now I know what school she goes to. <clears throat> so I continued to go through her photos and I started to see a lot of photos and a lot of videos of this young lady on the bus, taking the bus to school and from school. Uh, and this was the one video that stuck out to me. Um, if you look in the comments, uh, she's complaining about how this bus ride took 30 minutes and uh, how, you know, and now it's apparent to me that it takes less than 30 minutes to get home from the bus, uh, from school when she takes the bus. Uh, so there's this pattern. And again, this, this case that I'm starting to build. All right. So I go on her school website because now I know what school she is. And if you remember on her profile, she told me what her graduation year was. Uh, so I know that this young lady is uh, in seventh grade. So when I went on the school website, I found the bell schedule and I know that she's in seventh grade. So her last class of the day is uh, ends at 211. I also know that she's probably gonna get on the bus after school and it's probably going to take less than 30 minutes to get home. All right, starting to get creepy, I think. <laughs> uh, and again, I continued to look through her photos and I found this very interesting photo of her um, posing outside where she's talking about how happy she is that the weather's nice enough for her to be outside without her jacket. Uh, and as you can see, this is probably her place of residence, okay? Uh, and there's not much I can get from this photo, but there's a few things. Uh, I can see the building colors. It's a red and a gray, maybe a green, okay? And I know she's at an apartment building. And I also know she's less than 30 minutes away from, you know, where, where she goes to school. So I go to uh, Google and I just check out the, you know, apartments in the area. And I was able to narrow down only one apartment complex. Uh, this was the only one that had these colored buildings. OK, and uh, if you take a closer look at this photo in the background right there, uh, there's a building number. OK, um, so just with these few things, just a few photos and what was on her profile. Keep in mind, I didn't go through anybody else's profile, not moms, not any other family members. Uh, I'm pretty sure I found the apartment complex she lives in and the apartment building that she's standing outside of right now is probably the building where she lives, which is right across from building seven, okay? And I know that when she gets out of class at 211, she's gonna take the bus, okay? And it's gonna take less than 30 minutes to get home. So if I were not who I am and I were a predator, all I would have to do is park right here in this empty parking spot behind her, round 211, wait a few minutes, wait for her to walk by to make sure she never makes it home. All this I was able to find with just a couple clicks, okay? And the crazy thing is I didn't stop there. This, you know, didn't take any time at all. Uh, but I decided to see, you know, how many people have access to the things that I just found. Uh, if I search her name, the first thing that pops up is her Instagram. So anyone who knows her name, put it into Google, would have access to everything that I just showed you. Anybody to her YouTube channel, and I know it's her because there she is um, on the in that little photo right there. And if you notice, there's um, there's a little face right behind her. And that is her little brother, I believe. And the crazy thing that I always tell parents and everybody is sometimes predators will talk to older siblings to gain access to younger siblings. So maybe Jayla wasn't my only goal. Maybe now I also have a target on her little brother's back. Uh, here's a cute little video of him in the Ticket Blaster at Chuck E. Cheese. And I also have a list um, of her favorite songs. And I also now know her middle name. Uh, so just with a little bit of 
you know, just a little bit of research. Um, now I have something to even engage in conversation uh, with her because now I have a list of songs she likes. I have something to relate to her with. Uh, and that's how quickly these things can spiral. So in a nutshell, again, that probably didn't even take me 30 minutes to find all that information. Uh, I know her full name. I know what school she goes to. I know what grade she's in. I have her birthday. I know probably what apartment complex she lives in. I know that she's going to be across Building 7. I know her Snapchat user. I know her YouTube channel. I have a list of songs that she loves. I have her best friend's name, her best friend's Snapchat. And I also know when she's going to get home from taking the bus to school. Now, this is appalling, <laughs> you know, and just with photos. I haven't, again, I haven't looked at mom's social media. I haven't looked at any other friend's social media. This was just a few minutes on her Instagram. If she has a TikTok, if she has any other social media, how much more could I find? Uh, and that's a terrifying thought, especially terrifying if you're a parent and this is your child. Uh, so again, this is just how quickly that these predators can take advantage of, you know, innocent posting online, which kind of leads us into, you know, talking a little bit more directly about the enemy that we're dealing with, these predators that are out there. Uh, when we hear the word predators, we always think of like the boogeyman, right? Uh, but we can't really put a face to them. Or if we do put a face to them, we kind of have like this myth mythological version, uh, which is where we usually imagine them to be these creepy old men who are pedophiles pretending to be younger and abducting kids from their homes. We usually imagine the white van and the do you want a piece of candy uh, kind of person, uh, maybe somebody who lives in his mom's basement, something like that. That's usually where our minds go. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, all those, although some of those might exist, um, that's not the majority of the predators that we're actually seeing. Um, what we do know about predators is that, yeah, they are mostly men ages 26 or older. Um, but we are having, you know, several female predators uh, and several female traffickers that do exist. Um, there's usually a sense of safety when we're, you're having, you know, female predators um, because of, you know, it's not usually what you would imagine. So, you know, people are a lot more trusting of females when they're more than capable of being predators themselves. Uh, we're also seeing traffickers paying children to lure other children or using children uh, that they're already victimizing to lure other children into trafficking, uh, putting them in a situation um, that, you know, maybe this child might not trust an adult, but maybe they'll trust a friend who is being victimized by a, a trafficker or uh, a child who's just completely, you know, um, manipulated by a predator who's uh, already victimizing them. Uh, generally, you know, these predators may not have a criminal record. Um, you know, we always say that, you know, if you see a news story about like an outbreak of a predator, you'll usually hear somebody say, never in a million years would I have thought that person. Uh, these predators are really charismatic. They're not the creepy old man with the white van. They can be very charismatic. They can be very friendly, very attractive people. Uh, they can look like anyone. And usually more often than not, they are going to be social chameleons because they know to gain access to children, you have to get through the adults that are protecting them. So they're going to be very charming. Um, they're rarely going to lie about being an adult. Most of us are very fearful of catfish uh, and people who are pretending to be children and somebody that they're not. Um, but I'm just gonna tell you right now, predators don't even need to pretend that they're the same age as these kids. Kids will talk to whoever connects with them, whoever acknowledges them and whoever validates their feelings. Because through the veil of the screen, it's very easy to forget that you're talking to somebody in their 30s, 40s, and 50s when you're a 12 year old. Um, if that predator validates them and makes them feel good and gives them um, some kind of, you know, emotional support, usually these kids don't mind that they're talking to an adult. Um, so sometimes they don't even have to lie. And, and, you know, just being afraid of catfish, you know, again, they don't have to, they don't have to lie. Most of these kids will just talk to whoever connects with them. And again, uh, referring back to the beginning and the connection with runaways, usually these predators are not going to, you know, pull up to your house and scoop you up into their van and drive away. Uh, they're not going to abduct because they know 
if somebody witnesses that abduction, if that abduction goes wrong, you get a full-blown Amber Alert. You'll have Nevada child seekers, boots on the ground, volunteers, police out there looking for that child who is being abducted. But if they can convince the child to willingly leave the home, maybe after a fight with mom or maybe after, you know, if this child is being abused at home or something else is going on, they can convince that child to willingly leave the home. Uh, now, when that child goes missing, they'll be um, a they'll be considered a runaway where you don't get that Amber Alert, just like we talked about in the beginning. Uh, and, you know, Nevada child seekers will come out um, for any child that's missing, but, you know, you just don't get that same impact as when it has been established that the child was abducted. Um, there's, again, that huge stigma where if a child has run away, you know, they could always come back. Maybe they're being a rebel. Um, but again, that's not always the case. And we won't know until that child has been recovered. Now, with that being said, there are predators who are just in it for their own sick purposes. But again, we also have trafficking being a huge reality. Um, human, if for those, you know, human trafficking is modern day slavery. Uh, it, it involves exploiting a person through forced fraud and coercion for the purpose of forced labor, commercial sex, or both. Um, and victims of human trafficking can be men, women, boys, and girls. If you go on Nevada Child Seekers website, you'll see that we have uh, cases, male, female, every walks of life. Uh, we have cases in nice neighborhoods and not so nice neighborhoods. Uh, human trafficking can really happen anywhere. Uh, and one thing that, you know, we have noticed is there's generally two kinds of traffickers. There's the what we refer to as gorilla pimps, which is what you'll usually see in the movies, uh, where you'll have these traffickers who use violent sphere and control. Uh, but we also have this second type of trafficker, which we refer to as Romeo pimps. OK, um, usually these Romeo pimps will convince this whoever their target is that they're in a romantic relationship. Uh, and this is where you get cases where um, kids who are being trafficked believe that their trafficker is their boyfriend or their girlfriend. And there's a lot of confusion because they believe that they're in a relationship when they're actually, you know, being victimized and used by this trafficker, which can make recovering these trafficking victims so much more difficult because of the level of brainwashing and the level of, you know, that manipulation is so deep. Um, that will have these victims being, you know, running away from police, running away from help and running back to their trafficker. Um, so these are these kind of situations where, you know, something that somebody posts online can end up being a situation where, uh, again, this person thinks that their online boyfriend loves them and then they're in a trafficking situation and it can happen very fast. Uh, and, and once they're in that trafficking situation, it can get a lot more complicated. Um, so who are these predators after? Um, the victims generally, you'll see uh, usually early uh, adolescents, early puberty ages, uh, 13 to 15 generally, uh, sometimes uh, older and sometimes younger. Nevada Child Seekers has had cases, you know, as young as, you know, four years old recently. Um, and we're seeing uh, ages for trafficking get younger and younger. We've recently had uh, 10, 11 year olds involved in um, some pretty scary stuff. Uh, yeah, we are seeing that most of these victims are female. I'm sure you can imagine why. Uh, but 25% are boys um, report uh, exploitation, exploitation and solicitation. So the number could be a lot higher. Um, they're usually looking for uh, youth who have a history of some kind of abuse. Um, that's because, you know, usually part of the grooming process has been done for them and it's a much easier to manipulate um, a child who has been harmed and victimized before. And then last but not least, they're looking for youth who engage in patterns of risky behavior. So if this child's on TikTok and it's very obvious that mom and dad aren't watching what they're doing, nobody's looking out for them. They're posting that they're using drugs. They're posting that they're drinking out all night partying. Uh, what that tells predators who are looking through social media is nobody's looking out for this kid. Uh, if I talk to this kid, the likelihood of uh, somebody finding out is very slim because nobody's even paying attention to what they're posting online. Uh, and as a trafficker and as a predator, that's the kid you want. You want the kid that uh, nobody's really paying attention to, nobody's looking out for them on social media, uh, and somebody that they have easy access to. 
It's also important to uh, not forget about online gaming. You know, usually when we think of internet safety, we're worried about phones, computers, iPads, um, and we forget about online gaming, okay? <laughs> um, but again, many of these games allow us to have conversations with uh, strangers, complete strangers. Um, and uh, you also have to keep in mind, never in history have we ever had children who could potentially have a predator literally in their ear with these headphones. Um, a friend of mine, a couple years ago, she had a, she has, she, he was, her son was eight years old and he loved to play uh, Roblox and Fortnite online. And, you know, one day he left his headphones at a friend's house and uh, he decided to play with the volume all the way on. And while he was playing, he was playing online, talking to his friends. And my friend, his mom, walked by the room and heard her eight-year-old son talking to a grown man. So, of course, my friend goes to investigate and she turns out her son had been talking to a 53-year-old man for four weeks and she had no idea. If he had not left those headphones at home, um, she would have never known. And you also have to keep in mind with those microphones, you know, maybe you can hear mom's schedule. When's mom coming home? Maybe she has to take brother to soccer practice at a certain time. This is a way that, you know, a predator can also figure out uh, a family schedule. And this is also where we'll see more males getting, um, you know, victimized or, or you know, s deal with solicitation and, and things like that, because, you know, we have such a such a high uh, male presence on online gaming. So again, it's just something that's very important that, you know, even though usually when we think of these things, we're really worried about our daughters, we do have uh, to look out for our sons too. Now, this is kind of <laughs> a big slide right here with signs of online predators. And, and I did it this way because it's kind of important to break down how these predators really, you know, get into the lives of our children to victimize them and how it works and uh, why sometimes it can be very easy uh, for them to really manipulate our kids. So uh, initially these online predators are always gonna be very friendly. Of course, if they're really mean, nobody's gonna engage with them. Uh, but generally they'll you know, start out as this child's biggest fan. They'll be the first one to like all their things, first one to like all their photos and just kind of be a cheerleader initially. Uh, eventually it'll become, you know, a talking stage that the predator will engage the target, uh, to see if this child will engage in a conversation. Uh, usually, you know, for example, they might meet them on TikTok, then they'll want to privately message them. Uh, sometimes they'll try to have private conversations on Snapchat, uh, because there's an appeal of things disappearing after sharing. Uh, next, this predator is going to usually ask for personal information. This is kind of to test the child to see how much they're willing to share. Um, most of the time, these predators are already going to know a lot uh, because predators will do homework before they ever engage with the child. So what I did with Jayla is probably what that predator would do before ever even talking to that target, just to see what they know, to see if when they have the conversation with the child, if they're going to be honest about um, their life, things like that. Uh, next, this predator will ask lots of questions. Again, just to see how much this child's willing to share. Some of them may or may not be awkward or uncomfortable questions. Uh, again, this is because these predators are going to try to check the boundaries um, of this child. Uh, for example, if I, com if I comment on this child, uh, what this child's wearing, hey, I really like when you wear pink. I like when you wear short skirts. Is this child the type of person to be like, ew, why are you talking to me like that? Or is this the kind of child who's gonna be like, oh my gosh, thanks, and then wear more of what was complimented? Uh, so again, this is just how these predators are gauging uh, the boundaries of the child. And then they're always going to just kind of build this relationship by always agreeing with the child. They're going to validate every emotion of this child, whatever this child needs, emotionally, they're going to provide. They're going to be the best friend. They're going to be the shoulder to cry on. And if you're fighting with mom, I'm on your side, your mom sucks, you know, things like that. They're going to, they're really going to be an ally to the child initially. Then the predator will continue to stalk the child, constantly observing and then constantly monitoring this child's online, online activities. 
Now, the reason why they do this is because they're looking for opportunities. So what do kids do when they have a fight with mom or have a bad day at school or are getting bullied at school? They go on Instagram, they go on TikTok, they put a black and white filter on and they have a sad picture and they talk about how much their life sucks and uh, how they wish they were 18 and could get away from their mom and dad. You know, um, that's just being a teenager. And when these predators see these opportunities, that's when they engage. They will be the shoulder of the cry on. They're gonna be like, what happened? Give me the gossip, give me the tea. And then they'll provide emotional support uh, every time that child is in a vulnerable state. Uh, these predators will also stalk family and friends. Again, they wanna learn as much about this child as possible. They wanna know what kind of family this child has. Um, are their family gonna look out for them? Uh, is mom sharing a lot of stuff on her social media? Um, these are things that, you know, predators are constantly looking for because who's going to be the one to protect the child? It's mom and dad. It's the family. It's the guardians around them, whoever has the ability to um, kind of keep up with them. So if you're a predator, you want to know what kind of parent this child has, if, if possible. Uh, these predators will also continuously uh, inflate the ego of the child, constantly trying to make them feel special, uh, really kind of love bombing them, uh, making them feel good about themselves. Uh, again, at this point, this child will be so deeply and emotionally uh, involved with this predator uh, and reliant because they were able to be so emotionally available to them. Uh, and again, they will continue to rely on this predator every time they're in an emotionally vulnerable state. Now, once that child becomes very, um, you know, um, reliant on the support of that predator, uh, once they have built that kind of relationship, this is where you kind of start to see the predator kind of, you know, shift out a, a little weirdness. Uh, this is when the predator will start to try to turn the child away from friends and family. So maybe this predator will say, you know, I think you hang out with your friend too much. You should probably talk to me more. I'm feeling, you know, they'll gaslight them into feeling guilty for spending time with anybody else but them. Or uh, they might try to, you know, talk negatively about the parents. You know, if you lived with me, I would never do that. I can't believe your mom has all those rules. Uh, slowly dropping little bombs in these kids' heads uh, to doubt their parents and to doubt the affection of their parents uh, so that this child is more and more reliant on the predator. Uh, these predators might make up stories that don't ex that don't make sense. Um, for example, uh, we've had predators who have claimed to be brand ambassadors, um, you know, people who are, you know, what is it? Um, brand ambassadors, modeling agencies, uh, talking about how they're constantly traveling and they make all their money online, kind of like selling the dream about how amazing their life is. Uh, and in a way to kind of coerce the child into wanting to join them. Right. Uh, next, the, the predator might offer gifts. Um, they might, you know, we've had, you know, cases where predators were sending Uber Eats and Uber, Uber Eats and Grubhub to kids who don't have enough food at home. Uh, they might provide cell phones, they might provide bus tickets, um, something, you know, just a simple gift to, again, further the connection with the child uh, and further, you know, build that relationship. Um, and then again, once this relationship and this trust has been more and more established, then you'll see the predator start to ask for a little bit more. This is where they'll start asking for pictures. They'll start asking to video chat. Uh, they'll make uncomfortable comments. Uh, again, to check those boundaries once again to see if anything has changed now that that trust has been established. Then they'll ask uh, the child to lie. Don't tell your mom I'm uh, 19, tell your mom I'm 14, just like you. Don't tell your mom that you're coming to my house. Tell them that you're going to your best friend's house to sleep over. And then the lies come. And then the child wants to be, you know, closer and closer to that predator. Uh, then the predator will pressure the child into meeting them in person. Uh, this is where that child may choose to run away from home to meet up with that potential uh, abductor uh, or, you know, a crime will occur when they meet up. Um, and then once you know, that predator has photos or any kind of anything that they could use against the child, that's when the, you know, that niceness 
goes out the window. Now they have full control. Hey, you better do what I want you to do, or your mom's going to get this photo, or you better do what I want you to do, or, you know, this is where we have the threats of violence, or I have information on your younger sibling, or, you know, as soon as they have something to hold on to, that's when they flip that script and the predator is now, you know, no longer their friend, but, you know, a controlling aggressor. Uh, and they'll make those threats. And then at the very end of the day, the predator will gaslight the child into thinking that what they're doing is normal. Uh, again, this is where we have situations where children think that their uh, trafficker is their boyfriend or girlfriend. And uh, they'll say, you know, if you loved me, you would do this for me. If you loved our relationship, you would do this for me. And probably one of the biggest, uh, you know, words of advice that I can give anyone, any child is, if love is ever conditional, it's not love. If anybody ever says, um, if you loved me, you would whatever, that's a red flag, red flag, red flag, get out of there, okay? Um, because this is, you know, time and time again, what traffickers will do uh, to, you know, further manipulate that child to thinking what's happening is normal. Now, it can be hard to spot predators, um, but, you know, great rule of thumbs, if you don't know them in real life, there's a good chance you might be talking to one. Uh, I usually say if you have more than 100 followers, Uh, or um, you have, more. Um, so it's very, uh, very recommendable to keep profiles uh, as private as possible. I know that's not really fun thing when people want to go viral, but it is essential, especially with our young people, um, that we protect them in that way. Now, um, that kind of leads us into extortion. Like I said, this is where, you know, the, the process where these um, predators will have something against the child. Uh, and when extortion occurs, it's important to stop all communication, don't comply with requests, uh, keep the evidence, screenshot, 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 and reach out to help for help. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has cyber tip line. You can report anonymously 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, any kind of child exploitation, any even if you just suspect, this is a really great resource. They work really, really fast. They work with the Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force. Really, really great resource to reach out to if any child is experiencing any kind of extortion. Uh, and then um, again, leading into the second kind of predator. I know we're running out of time here, so I'll go a little fast. Uh, we have predators who simply have a goal of corrupting the mind of young people. Now, one thing to know is that there is no such thing as the perfect filter. Even if, you know, an app has kids at the end of it doesn't mean it's 100% safe. Example, YouTube kids. There are predators who specifically will post inappropriate content on kid uh, apps and, and resources and screens to corrupt the mind of children. Example here, you see Peppa Pig drinking bleach. Uh, sometimes it becomes sexual inappropriate content. And the reason why this is such a big deal is because specifically here in Southern Nevada, our law enforcement has notified us that there has been such an increase of child on child sexual abuse due to things that they have been seeing online. So for example, their favorite character might be Anna and Elsa. They're watching a YouTube kids video. They're going on an adventure and all of a sudden Anna and Elsa start to do something a little funny. And these children don't know what they're watching. So when their cousin comes over, or when they go home to see brother and sister, they try it out because that's what they saw their heroes doing. And then mom and da dad walk into the room. Where did you learn this? And it's all because of a YouTube kids video uh, that made it through the filters. And some of these predators will specifically hashtag uh, child friendly hashtags in order to put this in the line of what these children might stumble upon. Um, now, this is also the case with our teenagers, but in a little bit of a different way, uh, you know, a lot of interest in the dark web and the deep web. Um, a lot of people think it's very difficult to get on the dark web and the deep web, um, but actually you just need the right browser. Uh, right here is the Tor browser. If you ever see the Tor browser anywhere, this is going to be used to get on the dark web. That's the only reason why anybody would have that. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of illegal, very, very scary, very, very unsecure things on the um, on the dark web. So this is something that, you know, just as community members, it's important to be aware of in case we see this in our teenagers devices or we see it, uh, you know. Potentially, they're getting exposed to something like this, and this is just kind of something to kind of be on the lookout for. 
Um, now, this is a little bit of a aged dangerous apps, but these are some apps that we've kind of had problems here uh, in Southern Nevada. Uh, TikTok, really big one, but you'll notice most of these are dating apps. Spoon is another one. It's kind of like a podcast app, Snapchat. Um, these are just all ones that we recommend looking out for. I know Kick no longer exists, but um, again, a lot of these you'll notice are dating apps that these uh, predators are really, really using. Uh, so just be on the lookout for some of these because um, this is where we're seeing a lot of these predators uh, activity. Now, as far as resources go, I'm sure most of you are familiar with NetSmarts into the cloud, really great resource for kiddos. They also have resources for teenagers. Um, and then we always recommend parenting apps. Um, again, it's so important to be aware of what these kids are doing online. So on the side here, there are some parenting apps that we're always recommending to parents not to control what they're doing, but to be involved with what they're doing on their devices. Some of these even have tracking capabilities. You can kind of personalize it according to parenting style. So these are really, really great. great. A lot of them have free options. Um, now, this is really for Southern Nevada, but one thing that just in general, we always recommend to youth, because sometimes kids just don't feel safe enough to go home or call mom and dad after a situation. Um, specifically here in Southern Nevada, we do have um, Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth, uh, Shannon West Youth Center. Uh, we really just recommend that if a child is out there, they take advantage of the resources in the community and not an individual person because traffickers can sense when a child has run away, when a child is on their own. And to limit the ability for traffickers to take advantage of a situation, we always recommend that youth take advantage of organizations and the resources of those organizations rather than an individual who might be offering them food, shelter, or otherwise, uh, because you just don't know if that person has good intentions or not. We also have the Safe Place program where any RTC bus or Terrible's gas station, uh, anybody can walk in and say, I need a safe place, and those resources will be provided. Now, as far as Nevada Child Seekers go, we offer workshops free of charge uh, all over Nevada. Travel is a possibility. We just got to work out the um, details, but we also do them virtually as well for uh, elementary, middle, high school, and beyond, again, parents and, and other organizations for training on, you name it, anything that pretty much has to do with the reason why a child might be going missing. Uh, and that's pretty much my presentation. Here's my contact information. I know I'm going just a smidge over, but uh, I hope this was really impactful. And I hope, you know, this was really eye opening. Um, and so that you guys can understand what, you know, Nevada Child Seekers is always working with and how these things really are leaving our kids vulnerable. Um, so if anybody has any questions, thank you guys so much. And um, that's it. Oh, I don't know if I can hear you, Michelle. I think you're muted. <laughs> oh, there we go. Sorry. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> um, what I was saying was uh, thank you, Heather, for doing this presentation for us. Um, thank you all for being here. Like I said, I know we went over a couple minutes, but um, I am going to set a follow up email um, with some of the information, some links that we have, um, and then I'll include um, Heather's information. That way, if you guys want to reach out to her for any questions or set up a presentation. Um, and then we do have some slides um, that we'll include in there as well. Um, so again, thank you all for being here um, and do appreciate your time. So um, like I said, I will send up that follow up email by tomorrow um, with all the contact information. So thank you all for being here. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. everyone. All righty.